table here, I'm changing the evaporator out. I wasn't the one that diagnosed this, so I'm not really sure what's wrong with it, but I'm going to assume that it probably has a leak. Generally, we find it to be smarter to change the capillary tube whenever you change the evaporator or compressor just to prevent the callbacks. Um, sometimes you can get it right in there with a suction line, sometimes you can't. It just really depends on whether it's been ran through the wall or not. These are pretty simple to do. Always keep an eye on your door seals, and door seals are all good. That'll cause you some condensation buildup if they aren't good. Alright, looks like we got a little bit of oil here on this capillary tube. I'm going to pull the thermostat out. This senses coil temperature not box temperature for the shutoff point. I should, I should rephrase that. This senses the coil temperature to turn off and it's a constant cut in at generally 38, 39 degrees. That way you know the, that the coil has defrosted before allowing the compressor to come back on again. One thing I've ran into when I first started on these was they got enough refrigerant to freeze up, but they don't uh, have enough refrigerant to get the coil cold enough to actually reach the 18 to 17 degrees, depending on how it's set up to shut off. So they just run, 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 run. Not the most sensitive thing in the world. Looks like we got a couple spots there in the uh, coil that's leaking, not just right here. Man, this thing is so slow to respond. That's why I like my H10. I just thought I'd give it a benefit of the doubt. Looks like they've changed this a little bit. Now it's plastic. Usually that's aluminum. When you got this out, it's a good time to clean your drain out and stuff because your drain tends to get packed full of crap. Go ahead and get our cap tube cut little bulb over here that's your accumulator it's just a, a copper pipe with one tube going down one coming out it's kind of almost something you could easily make yourself it's just something the factories do that uh, helps give it a little extra protection this will be an easy one to change as far as cap tubes concerned it just uh, it's attached to the suction line here for barely a foot junk clamp on taps that'll be gone but I might get done we're gonna put that on brace that on solid We'll be changing the filter dryer, of course, and we're going to put a cap T, an O32. That will also give us a high side port so we can charge it a little easier. And it also helps tell us whether or not we're getting a restriction. Yeah, I really like these cap T dryers. They're made for capillary tubes. Basically, it comes with a Schrader core. It says it's specifically made for it, basically meaning it has more filtering capabilities. It's got a high side port here on it. It's only on the incoming side. And then uh, basically these here are what we use for our suction port. And that, uh, that'll give us a nice dedicated spot. So we'll grab our evacuation bucket here and we'll go ahead and get started on some of that stuff. Went ahead and bent this up to there so we can get the new dryer in line with it without any major problems. It's gonna mount up right in there like that. You don't want to open this until it's time to brace it in. Now the thing I've noticed with this, that aluminum that they're putting on there, it's a dissimilar metal. So it has a tendency to corrode on the copper. So it's great that it's conductive values there, but honestly, I really ain't too impressed the way it turns out. Right there's your capillary tube. What I'll do sometimes is, you know, if the factory don't have the specs on it, we'll just measure it out. Make sure it's the same length as the other one because I don't want this match. But we'll match it up, make sure it's the same. Sometimes it'll give you a little extra. So basically we've got four inches extra here. I'm gonna go ahead and cut it like that. That's gonna smash the end there together. Only taken off about a quarter of an inch. So there's that. That's going to be pinched together. Now we can send it down through there. I want a majority of my line to be back here in the cooler. So we're going to go ahead and shove that down through there. So we're going to bring that down 
to here to there. What I've done in the past is I've actually wound it around the accumulator on the inside and then insulated it. I'm going to sleeve it with that uh, uh, clear plastic tubing I got so that way if any vibration happens here that we don't uh, rub it into one of these sharp edges. You can see I'm able to slide that on over top of it. It's hard to make it the whole way so I'm just going to do a couple strips here. And that's going to protect us as we go through this sharp edge. There we go. Make it a little easier. I may have to trim it back a little bit so when I braise that in there I don't melt the plastic too much. Don't want it to look like crap. Now one thing you got to keep in mind if you're going to try to unbraise that there's a good chance there's oil build up in here so you might have a little bit of a flare up. Also we don't really want to melt the plastic. You can see some of the crud that's getting down in there in that drain. That's going to cause it to plug up later. A lot of times I don't worry about nitrogen on the, on the unbrazing. I mean, I try to do it as best as possible, but sometimes it just doesn't get done on every little small piece. I'm not going to say I do it every time, but I do try to do it 98, 99% of the time. All right, that looks a lot better now. Got all that crap out of there. Just a few stains left. Now's the time to get it all cleaned out. Get it all cleaned up. There we go. That screwdriver there holding it. I'm gonna put a wet rag up there. Get that brazen in position. Alright, got her all in there. It's all nice and ready to go. Now we can run some nitrogen back through, through here. Okay, I have my dedicated line here. Do a little purge. Get everything out of the uh, coil and all that. And then once that's done, go down to purge only. Wet it and then I can feel it and I know it's coming through. Get the rag on there. That's going to help protect the plastic over here. It's also going to help protect that insulation that's on the suction line. I see it looks fairly decent. Got good uniform connections all the way around. Got it a little bit warm there on that part, which that pain is to try to protect the uh, copper from the vinegars and stuff that tends to be inside the coolers that tends to make these leak. Make a nice little loop. Here's your cap tube cutters. Basically it's just a V-shaped. Cutter. You can do the same thing with wire strippers, just not as nice. So we said we had about a couple extra fingers lengths. So we're going to go ahead and cut that. That puts a nice circle cut on it. Got to keep that back here a bit. And then we're going to stick this inside of the coil about two to three inches. Right now we've got nitrogen coming through. What I'll do is I'll do a large blast of nitrogen. And then I'll go ahead and braise it. I'll actually shut it off um, and then braise it. That'll displace the oxygen. And then, like you got to remember, it's going to be coming in from the capillary tube into the coil. So anything that might have got in there is going to get caught in the suction side into the uh, compressor. It, uh, it's about the best way I can figure to come up with, with a way of doing it. You figure, I would say a good majority of everybody doesn't even do this. So I just try to do my best. Got to get that base metal warm first if possible. That time you didn't see anything at all, even melt the uh, 
paint on the uh, tube there. Oh my god. Okay, now I can feed from the suction side and I can feel the air coming through, nitrogen. So I know that we're clear, we're no, I know we're not restricted, there's nothing worse than uh, getting this thing together, charge it up and it's restricted because you've got the uh, cap tube uh, gum shut. Okay, the thought process behind this is that we're going to get this part here brazed in first. That way any carbon is going to get caught back here, not here. I'll sit there and hold my finger up there to see about how far I'm into the filter dryer. I want to be in there far enough that I'm not going to uh, have any capillary action to pull the braze into the uh, cap tube. We're purging through there, getting that dryer nice and cleared out. And we're going to drop it down to the lowest setting on my building regulator. Now I'm just trying to keep the dryer somewhat cool here, not making shooting for perfect. Cool for a moment. I don't want to rush into it and cause a crack, especially with as small as a pipe that is. Everything looks pretty clean and clear there. We'll trim off that little burnt piece there. Okay, my feelings on this right here is yeah, it's 3 8 but you're reducing down to a capillary tube right here. So I'm not too overly concerned about it being on the inside of the pipe. And this is just to help make my seal around the edge of course. And we'll crank that up again. There we go. I don't like getting it too close because it'll cool down the joint to the point where it'll actually be on the joint longer. And that actually takes more time to do it right to get it warm enough. Got all the way underneath and all the way on top. Went ahead and cleaned this up a little bit here. So everything looks pretty decent for an amateur. I went ahead and pulled this out a little bit. You know, one thing my dad taught me, and he's a welder, is that uh, if you can't see your work, you can't see what you're doing, you can't do a good job. So if you gotta bend things a little bit within reason to get to them properly and not burn the things up and torch the product you're working on, go ahead and move it around a little bit. It's uh, filling up now and we'll check her out. We just scanned it with the ultrasonic leak detector. I did not hear anything. Pressure's not dropping. I'm gonna go ahead and soap it just in case. Here's a little hack that you can do to your light tube, two magnets on it. That makes it so much easier. And uh, holds it wherever you need it. All right, I went ahead and just did it with the aluminum tape again. Got my cap tube all done up there. All right, got her all insulated. Added extra wire ties to it just to make sure that if it did come undone that it's gonna hold there. Got that loop insulated because that's gonna possibly condensate and uh, sweat. All right, if you wanna see something massively overkill, we got the turbo six million here. You got it, you might as well use it. That's the way I look at it. That compressor's gonna have refrigerant in it. A lot of the reason why I'm kind of bumping it around to make it release. The refrigerant gets stuck in the bubbles, or gets stuck in the oil. Alright, that uh, cap tube there from the thermostat goes into this little tube there, and then you're supposed to seal that with a little bit of cork tape so that you don't get moisture in there. Even with these monster hoses, and at 21 minutes, it's only hit around 600. I valved it off. It rose up to about 1350, and then dropped down to about eh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 microns a second on a rise rate for the blank off test. So the only thing that's left in there now is refrigerant. 
if it was a leak, it would just kept on rising. Okay, we're at 443. We're gonna go ahead and shut her back down here. Like I said, I've already done my blank off test once before. So I know that it's uh, gonna rise some. You're only gonna get so far when it comes time for moisture when it's PLE oil. So we're at 1,020. It's massively slowed down compared to the way it was before. We went ahead and purged vapor through our hoses all the way up to it. So, and I'm gonna break the meth of you can't use six foot hoses because you'll lose too much refrigerant because the way I do it is I valve it off on the high side, suck it back in. You're only talking probably a tenth of an ounce, quarter of an ounce when you're talking vapor, not liquid. Yeah, it's definitely not going in as fast as what you normally see. But because when we purged our nitrogen through there, we knew that it only went one direction or the other. There's high pressure. I'm gonna suck the rest of it in. There she goes. It's feeling warm, which tells me it's not pumping down yet. We're going to get close to our, our negative there, so we're gonna go ahead and throttle this in slowly. Don't want to sit there and flood our compressor. So it's gonna be a little low on the suction pressure because We've got liquid from here to here that needs to be pulled back into the system yet. So we're running a 98 degree liquid temperature. I'm going to valve off our incoming refrigerant. So we're isolated into this bunch here. Go ahead and I'll just valve it off here. And we'll just go ahead and let her suck that back in. Suction should come up maybe around 15 to 18 hopefully. no liquid lost. Whenever you're playing with uh, new cap tubes and stuff like that, there's always a chance that maybe they didn't get you the exact one that you should have or maybe something's not quite right. So we may have to add an ounce or two to it. We're just going to watch it for a bit and see how it reacts. One of the things you got to watch when you're checking superheat on these compressors is that you're actually doing it back at the evaporator, not out here, because you've already added some heat to it or with the capillary tube hooked to it, so you don't want a false reading. Uh, so this is not going to be 100% accurate by doing it here. Right now, currently, our superheat's right at uh, 53. It is coming back cool, but you don't want to jump the gun and go changing things. Um, fans running. And uh, we're just going to watch our box temperature. We're going to see how things go. Things can change sometimes when they're running. You would figure it's going to come down once it's uh, running. But we're just going to give it a second. This dryer here can possibly hold a little bit more than the dryer that was in there from the factory. Um, usually it will say on the dryer box itself what you have to add. I try to go with this uh, O32 because it's usually pretty comparable to the... Uh, pencil dryers. I don't like those pencil dryers because they got loose fill in there and they seem to get plugged up easier and that loose fill when uh, the systems go low on refrigerant it'll bake that oil and it goes in there and it breaks those beads down because it's running so hot because it don't have the refrigerant in there to cool the compressor and that goes in there and plugs up your cap tube and then uh, the whole system is pretty well got to be uh, tore apart and clean. Superheat's running 43. You wouldn't want real low superheat this early into the game. Generally, I mean, it's all interesting if you read the history on how capillary tubes are calculated out because it's actually trial and error. They'll get ballparked, and then at the very end, they'll actually have to trial and error it when they're engineering the box. And because uh, there's no exact perfect way to get it dead nuts on. So that's why these critically charged systems generally need to be charged exactly the way they say to do it. Gauges off. Showing right at about 10. That's definitely lower than what I like to see. But it's not quite like air conditioning when you had to focus on 
your evaporator temperatures because this will defrost itself. All right, went out to the truck and uh, she shut down. Came back in, just checked the uh, thermometer inside the cooler. It's at 38, so it's soon to come back on here in a minute. I'm going to stop where we're at. Uh, I'm not going to overcharge it. You have a miniature accumulator right here to help protect the flood back. So I'm not going to take away that protection by overcharging it. Obviously, it's reaching temperature. All right, that's going to wrap this one up. I just want to take a moment to thank you guys for subscribing and wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving out there. Pressures wasn't exactly where I would have liked to have seen them at, but at this point, since it's cooling and everything looks good uh, as far as uh, temperatures are concerned, I'm going to go with the fact that uh, I used OEM parts and there's no good excuse why it wasn't. I've primarily done everything I can do and it just kicked back on. So if you liked the video, please like, share, and subscribe. And most importantly, please click that notification bell because only 20 to 30% of you guys actually click that. Until next time, we'll catch you on the next one.